And I think that just we as a culture too are sort of losing faith in our ability to understand the complexity of the world, just because it has become so complex that, you know, at a certain level, um, machines are actually better at comprehending it than we are. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you are listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio, where we keep you up to date on the latest technological trends and how they're impacting the transformation of consciousness and culture. This week, my guest is Megan O'Giblin, who has written regularly for entities such as Wired, The New York Times, and The Guardian, in addition to authoring books such as Interior States and her latest book, God, Human, Animal, Machine, technology, metaphor, and the search for meaning. Interestingly, much of Megan's work pulls on her experience losing her faith in religion while simultaneously being drawn into transhumanism because of reading The Age of Spiritual Machines by Singularity's very own Ray Kurzweil. By exploring this background of Megan's, as well as her most recent book, we are able to take a journey through the ways in which technology and spirituality have historically woven together, the current ways in which they are conflicting, and the future philosophical questions that we're going to be forced to reconcile. For those of you interested in this subject, I want to quickly recommend that you go and you listen to episode 52 with Micah Redding, because that conversation lays the foundation for a lot of the things that we're going to be building on in this episode. But for now, let's focus on our current guest. So everyone, please welcome to the feedback loop, Megan O'Giblin. Well, then, as most of the listeners of this podcast will know, my favorite place to start with anybody like yourself who is an author who wrote a book that I'm deeply fascinated with, what was it that motivated you to spend so much of your time and energy investing in this topic? Yeah, well, my book uh, really grew out of a longstanding obsession I had, which was about the connections between um Christianity, spirituality, and theology, which is sort of my background, um, and and technology, sort of the conversations that, that we're having about emerging technologies. So a um, little bit about my background. I grew up um, in a fundamentalist Christian family um, and was raised in this very, I would say, cloistered evangelical community. I went to Bible school for college um, and studied theology and eventually had, um, I had a crisis of faith while I was there. I ended up leaving the church and leaving the faith. And so um, I identify today as agnostic, but it was soon, um, soon after that, after I left Bible school that I started reading about technology. Um, I actually had a friend at um, my work who lent me a copy of Ray Kurzweil's The Age of Spiritual Machines. And that was sort of my entry point. Um, and I went deep down this transhumanist rabbit hole and was just fascinated by that whole worldview and by by the conversations that were happening about technologies by the speculations about what might you know how technology might change us as humans um and really was fascinated by the resonances with the the sort of questions that we were studying as theology students um and and students of sort of the christian the, the history of christianity um questions about you know resurrection is it possible, you know, to achieve immortality through through science and technology? These are things that some of the early church fathers were talking about um, in 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 one sense or another. Um, and yeah, and questions about also, um, I guess, more broadly, super intelligence. Um, a lot of those questions brought back to me um, things that I'd thought about in terms of our relationship as humans to God. You know, so this that before you know we ever started thinking about technological super intelligence, we we had sort of had this you know creation of of our minds, God, who is much more you know omniscient, omnipotent, was which was far beyond our our capacities, our mental capacities as humans, and um, a lot of those questions that I had really struggled with um, as a student of theology were, were coming up in, in discussions about emerging technologies and AI. So that was sort of my starting place for the book. I had written a few essays, um, 
drawing those parallels. Um, and then the book was really just a way to go deeper into mm -hmm. some of those connections and to also tie it back sort of to look at like where are these resonances actually coming from um, and to go sort of deeper into the history of the technologies and see how Christian ideas inflected them. Yeah, so in that journey from the earlier articles, which I believe was about 2017 until this book, mm -hmm. uh, about a four-year period, what did you find? What were some of the ways you kind of saw the Christian eschatology uh, paralleling transhumanism or how did things maybe change in your perception of that uh, comparison? Yeah, well, yeah, so my starting place with the thinking about transhumanism in particular was, you know, there's all of these similarities, both, you know, to, to thinking about Christ, its, its relationship to Christian eschatology. You know, both, um, both of these narratives look forward to a future when humans, first of all, the human body is perfected or improved in some way. Um, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about how we're going to have a glorified body and uh, a lot of different Christian theologians have talked about what that means. Um, Augustine believed that we would have expanded knowledge uh, in the afterlife, that we would basically have this sort of, um, you know, an, explode, an intelligence explosion in a way. Um, and, you know, no more suffering, no more death. Um, and then this idea of resurrecting the dead too, which has come up, you know, in, in sort of different conversations about digital resurrection. Um, and so there were all of these similarities and um, I, I started to feel like that couldn't have been coincidental. Um, what, what I found is, I think the most interesting thing I found, first of all, is that the first time that the word transhuman uh, appeared in English was in a translation of Dante's uh, Inferno. And it is in a passage where he's actually describing the resurrection. Hmm. Um, and it, you know, in, in Italian, I think the word he uses is transhumanar. He says, you know, words cannot describe the transhuman change that's going to be. And it was, he made up a word just to, you know, describe what this, this transformation was supposed to be. And um, yeah, and so when it was translated into English, it was translated as transhuman. And um, so my essay on that topic was really just tracing how did that word get from, you know, Dante um, and then, you know, reappearing again in, in around the 1950s. Um, and so I looked at a lot of different um, movements, you know, like the Russian Cosmos and, and Nikolai Fedorov, um, you know, talking about similarly, um, a lot of the ideas that we, we associate today with transhumanism, like resurrecting the dead in particular, this is a real fixation for, um, you know, for, for the Russian cosmos, but using um, a Christian framework. So seeing how we can bring about those prophecies in the Bible through science and technology. Um, and then I look from there to, to Pierre Tehard de Chardin, who's a French Jesuit priest who wrote about um, a lot of these, these ideas um, back in the 1950s, it was his work, it's really crazy to go back and read it today because it was so prescient. He was writing during the age, you know, basically radio and, and television. And, um, you know, basically he envisioned that at some point mass communication was going to become so interconnected around the world and so um, closely merged with human consciousness that it was going to create something called the new sphere. Um, and this was going to be this great merging of intelligence. And this was actually going to eventually merge with the divine intelligence. And he called this the Omega point, which is sort of, a, I think a lot of histories of transhumanism now actually acknowledge that as a precursor to the singularity of this moment where we sort of merge. Um, with the divine, and, and he believed that that was basically how the resurrection, the Christian resurrection, was going to take place. Um, and so, yeah, he he used the word transhumanist um, or transhuman in um, one of his works in the 1950s. And I believe that he got it from Dante. There's a lot of speculation about whether he stole it from Dante or, or if it was just a coincidence. But um, yeah, and and then you know he was friends with. Julian Huxley, who then sort of popularized the term around the same time in, in a lot of his essays. Um, so that, that etymology to me was just fascinating that it did have this longer history when it was used in, in more explicitly um, religious contexts. So yeah, that was, that was, I guess, my starting place for, for that yeah. particular essay. 
do you think these transhuman thinkers and and really i guess the society that's come after them which is really just i think by default now kind of techno techno optimistic you know we're we're tech obsessed tech is so much part of all of our lives do you think that that love of technology and that techno optimism was really just a secular response to the decline of religion i mean was it pretty much like we're in a judeo christian worldview that's what we know but we don't want to believe that specific framework so we'll just make a secular version that uses the most fancy stuff that we know of at this time a point in time like does, do you think that's a lot of what just happened there i mean that's that's definitely my sense of what was happening and it's really difficult to to argue that more broadly <laughs> because you can't prove that that's what's happening you know if if it is true that we're just trying to sort of recapitulate you know um, these religious hopes and longings in a materialist framework, it's definitely happening on some unconscious level, I yeah. think, you know, because especially, I, I think um, the movement, you know, today, transhumanism is, is much broader um, than it was when I was first exposed to it. But the, the, at the time that I was reading, you know, Kurzweil, which was in the early 2000s, um, most of the people who identified as transhumanists were, you know, strictly rationalists, atheist um didn't want to associate their worldview with with christianity at all basically um so you know i i think though i mean the the way that i see it um and this is just using my own experience maybe as a microcosm you know coming from a religious framework having this hope that you know immortality is waiting for me after death, that the, the world is going to be transformed and restored to its original perfection. Um, and then having to leave that behind, um, that, that was a really difficult process for me. And I think that in a sense, it embodies what happened um, in you know, traditionally Christian cultures over a much, much slower, longer period. And so I, I do feel like in some sense, we as a culture must be mourning the loss of that framework. Um, and I think it's not surprising that, you know, it creeps back into, into these, you know, discussions about the future that are not explicitly religious. Yeah. And I think of um, one of my favorite interviews that I, I, I did, had done in the past was with John Verveke, if you're familiar with him. He does. No, the I'm not. He's a, he works at the University of Toronto, I believe, um, Cognitive. Uh, science, but um, he talks a lot about the meaning crisis and how currently we're in what he would call a meaning crisis. And I know you talk about when you were, you know, leaving the faith that I think you described it as an existential dizziness, um, like a kind of vertigo that you were, uh, the rest of the world was moving on while you were standing still. Do you think that that is actually starting to happen to us now as well because of the pace of change that technology is bringing to us? Like, do you think can, can maybe you can describe that experience for you personally when you you did leave the faith and started thinking about technology but also is that where we're at now is that same sense of vertigo where we're like i i feel dizzy at how fast things are moving and i feel like i'm staying in the same place yeah yeah it's it's interesting to think about i mean in terms of both religion and technology how those change our sense of time and mm -hmm. history um, I, I, something I really took for granted growing up um, and, you know, this Christian framework and, and that I didn't really realize until I lost my faith was that I, you know, by default had this very linear um, and progressive view of history, right? That, the, you know, we're not just here hanging out, that history is going somewhere, that it's, you know, fulfilling this larger purpose, that it's moving toward this moment of perfection. Um, and yeah so i think to lose that that was the main thing i i felt was dizziness and, and stasis at the same time this feeling like um my my version of history had stopped and everyone else seemed you know sort of okay with <laughs> with the idea that we were all going to die and you know <laughs> these really sort of bleak things that if you have to deal with them you know i think most people sort of come to terms with that in a much younger age and having to deal with it at you know the age of 25 is sort of a different experience but um, I mean, to some extent, I think that our view of history today um, has inherited a lot of that so, sort of notion of progress. Um, 
you know, just the idea that, and especially if you think about narratives about technology, just more broadly outside of transhumanism, this idea that, you know, we are, you know, getting better as a culture that we're, you know, you know, our, our lifespans are um, increasing, you know, we sort of, um, you know, triumphed over certain diseases. Um, you know, for a long time, I think that was that was a narrative that sort of carried us despite the increasing, you know, secular nature of our culture. Um, now, I don't know if that's still the narrative. I think it seems like everyone's, you know, sees things a little bit more more bleakly now. Um, and I think that there has been a lot of disenchantment in the past few years about technologies that were, you know, seen in a very utopian light when, when they first emerged, even thinking about things like social media. Um, and AI. And um, so, yeah, maybe it's true that we are at a moment of stasis right now. Um, stasis and then also this, yeah, I, dizziness um, because, you know, the, the culture is changing so quickly. Mm. You know, technologies that, um, you know, I was uh, introduced to you know, when I was coming of age uh, now um, are so integrated into the culture and, you know, we, we have all of these new things every year. I think that that really changes our, our sense of time. Yeah. And, Speaking of uh, that, that, that combination of metaphors, I guess, or disenchantment that's happening. Um, I just recently talked to Jonathan Haidt and he released his article about how our current maybe dizziness or disenchantment is a result of this tower of babel like mm -hmm. moment where we've fragmented and we've lost the ability to communicate and it makes me think you know that that article has been really well received i think obama put it on a reading list and immediately and all of this stuff but it's a just a metaphor and one of the, the subtitle of your book has to deal with technology metaphor and meaning so how does metaphor play into this in your mind what is the role of metaphor in this conversation yeah i was really curious about um i, I guess the the first way in which it got into the book was i was curious about technological metaphors um and particularly how we talk about our own minds in using computational metaphors um which you know on one hand is you know pervasive in, in cognitive science and um but is also just very widespread in our culture you know anytime you say i'm processing new information or you know i'm like retrieving something from my memory we're drawing on you know technological metaphors that's not actually how our how our minds work um so i was curious about where those metaphors came from um and and how accurate they were which led me you know, to think a bit more and do a lot of reading about consciousness, which I initially did not want to explore in the book, just because it's the most, you know, sort of profound um, problem in, in philosophy currently. And, um, but yeah, I, I just found it really fascinating to know, um, you know, as a lay person, just to think about like how little we still know about the mind um, and that we're always grasping for these metaphors, you know, and the metaphors have changed in, in the past, you know, mm -hmm. we've, you know, compared the mind to an electrical circuit or um, a telegraph or, you know, even in ancient Greece, it was compared to a chariot. Um, so the, the fact that these, these metaphors keep changing um, and that we, there's this tendency to compare it to things that we've created. Um, and, and I'm particularly interested in the moment where we forget that metaphors are metaphors, um, yeah. because obviously, you know, the, the metaphors are problematic. And I think that the question that people always ask me when I say that is, oh, well, what should we, what are the new metaphors we should use? Or how do we not use metaphor? And it's like, well, you can't not use metaphor. Metaphor is a basis of, of thought, of language. You know, it's not something you can get away from. They're always going to be imperfect. They're always going to be a form of grasping. But um, I, I think the, the problem for me comes when we forget that they're metaphors and we take them literally. So, you know, to say that the mind is not like a computer, but it is a computer, you know, to say that the universe is not like a computer, but it's actually a, you know, a computer, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which is, you know, happens in in the field and outside of it um, as well. So, um, yeah, so that a lot of the book is thinking through those terms and how we use them. Do you, do you think using those technological metaphors have changed the way we think about ourselves, about society, about our place in the world, like as opposed to maybe 
older metaphors does the i guess modern computational metaphor do you feel like it changes who we are mm -hmm. yeah i think it does um i think you know and a lot of the book is is sort of trying to explore what that means even mm -hmm. for me subjectively as somebody who used to believe for example that i had a soul um, this was what I was taught, and I, and I believed it up until you know my my twenties, like quite quite um, later than than most people who are raised religious do. Um, you know that that this was what set humans apart and made us ontologically distinct from animals, from you know a tree, from a computer. Um, that there was this essence that was supernatural within us, um, and that was you know obviously what we as a culture believed for a long time, and I think. Um, for me, that was really unnerving um, to, to realize that I didn't have a soul and that there, you know, then the question becomes, well, what is the difference between me and, you know, a very advanced form of AI? Mm -hmm. And that question gets really thorny and it's very difficult to say, you know, what, what is it that separates um, my mind from a machine? Um, and yeah, I mean, you can think about it from different angles, you know, how do we qualify what what makes something existentially valuable you know the soul used to be sort of this is what made something alive this is what you know to say somebody was made in the divine image is sort of to you know this is where you know humanism came from this idea mm -hmm. basically and um you know if if so so there's that question about value and then there's also i think just the question of like determinism i guess for back of, lack of a better phrase you know like how much free will do i actually have am i just doing what i'm programmed to do or am i making you know deeply reasoned um you know choices about every aspect of my life and that was something that really unnerved me too when i left well I actually started a bible school this question of free will because uh, i was you know studying in a very um calvinistic tradition um you know where we believed in predestination um and all of that so that was another question, or I guess another parallel that I ended up exploring in the book too, is this question of, of determinism and free will. Yeah. So where have you landed now? I mean, we don't have to get into free will yet. I think we might, cause that could be fun, but do you feel like maybe what you consider the soul previously is now just something you consider a pattern of information? And, and if that is the case, do you think that pattern can be encapsulated by technology can it be just simply computed or is there something that you think still may be uh, emergent about it that may not uh be something we can put into to, into machines i think that actually when i started um writing the book i was more convinced um that our minds are just patterns of information basically um and the more, and I think that this happens for a lot of people who are, um, you know, if you start reading about consciousness, you just realize like how little we actually know and how many like crazy theories there are um, <laughs> that, you know, some people, I, I love reading, you know, some people like David Chalmers who started out sort of in more of a physicalist tradition and then became, you know, interested in panpsychism and idealism mm -hmm. and all of these other theories. Um, and I think part of the, the fun of, of reading and, and writing about those ideas for me was just realizing like how many possibilities there really are. I think if anything, my understanding of what the mind is expanded the more I read. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm comfortable at this point saying I'm completely agnostic on the question of consciousness of these people who have devoted their lives to thinking about it can't figure out what it is. I, I certainly can't. And I and I love that. I mean, and that's that's yeah. part of the fun of reading about it is it's just this endless mystery that um, maybe we'll figure it out someday. I don't think it's something that is completely, you know, obscured from our understanding, but, but at the moment, I don't think that we can say for sure if it's mm -hmm. something that could, you know, for example, be uploaded um, onto a computer. Um, so I don't know, I, I guess I've become a fan of, you know, people who have more intellectually intellectual humility about that question mm. um, and that are sort of open to, to the different possibilities that are, are being discussed right now, which are really exciting. 
I appreciate that. I try to constantly push in the uh, potential for free will based on emergent properties. So, <laughs> oh I, yeah, I, I love arguing against the materialist who uh, yeah. assume physics has to answer everything. I'm sympathetic to that as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, despite that, though, do you think that we're going to be forced to to answer these questions because of of technology? Like, I think of. Um, like self-driving cars, for instance, in the trolley problem, you know, the trolley problem was a thought experiment for a long time. We could kind of brush under the rug as as philosophical fun. But now we have self-driving cars that might have to actually have code that say, yes, kill a person to save five people. And, you know, they're going to have to probably say that because somebody in that car doesn't want to know that the car is going to make an ambiguous decision <laughs> when that moment comes. But at the same time, we're programming a machine to say yes, kill a person. Like, mm -hmm. do, do you think in the same way, maybe consciousness might, or the same way the trolley problem might have to be answered, you know, these deeper philosophical questions are going to have to be answered as well because of how fast technology is pushing us into those areas. That's something that's very frightening to me is yeah. that, yeah, you have these philosophical problems that have not, no one's been able to solve for centuries. And now, okay, we got to figure out how to, you know, yep. program them into machines. Um, and, you know, the expediency with which that's being done, I mean, and, and sort of the lack of a broader public ethical discussion about it is, is something that it's very frightening to me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it's interesting to think about how just these sort of pragmatic, you know, or just seeing what machines are capable of doing even has, has changed these longstanding debates. You know, I'm thinking about like, um, you know, large language models mm. and what they've been able to, to do in terms of, of producing language without consciousness. Um, and, you know, the way that that's sort of changing debates about, you know, whether language structures are, you know, innate in the, the brain or, you know, whether it's just all, you know, math and probabilities. Um, I think especially as, as a writer, you know, those are questions I've sort of thought of on a more intuitive level for, a long time, you know, how aware am I consciously of what I'm doing? How much of it is, you know, just sort of regurgitating narrative patterns that I've encountered in the past. Um, and when you see, you know, you interact with something like GPT-3, um, it really does, it changes the way that I think about my own use of language um, and, and maybe disenchants it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would hope that there would be more public debate about those questions because it's true that a lot of these are very old questions that we haven't solved. Mm. Um, and that, you know, maybe we'll solve through seeing how technology deals with them, but I don't, I think that's going to come at a high cost. Yeah. Do you think that the, you know, 2000 plus years of, uh, I guess, momentum or, theory crafting that religion has created has some guidance for for people in the technological domain or do you think even though these philosophical questions seem similar what we're dealing with now is like out of the scope of of, of that spiritual guidance i definitely think that there's something to learn from looking at older iterations of these discussions mm -hmm. um if if i mean if, if nothing else just for that sense of humility of mm -hmm. like you know how enduring these problems are um and and maybe also just seeing sort of the the wildly different ways in which people thought about them in the past i think it's really easy to get sort of stuck in our own frameworks and in our own sort of you know limited culturally informed ways of thinking about things um so yeah, I think it can be useful to think about the ways in which those discussions have happened um, in, in the past in different contexts. Mm -hmm. And do you think we're going to see religion adapt well to the changes we're coming up to? Like, do you think it's going to integrate and we're going to see dataism in the, the church of the great AI? Or are we going to see religion, you know, basically become kind of endangered and maybe go extinct as, as, as we know it? I don't think it's going to become extinct. Um, no, and and you know there there was uh, again sort of this narrative about you know or you know maybe ten years ago where everybody was talking about the rise of you know secular secularism, the rise of the nuns, how young people were not religious at all, 
Um, and it's true that I think, you know, traditional institutionalized religion has taken a, a hit over the years. Um, but in some ways, I think that we're more spiritual than ever. You mm -hmm. sort of broaden that um, in terms of, you know, you could even include a, astrology or manifesting or all of these things that have become very popular um, in, in digital spaces, especially. Um, and yeah, so it'll be interesting to see, I guess, how, so maybe it's two sort of two ways of thinking about that as how institutionalized religions are going to deal with this. Um, my experience so far with, for example, evangelicalism, which is the tradition I'm most familiar with, um, is that they are largely threatened by technological advances, particularly those that um, are, you know, will potentially change human nature in some way. Mm -hmm. So all of those sort of transhumanist ideas. There, there are a minority, though, um, of, of Christians who are interested in those ideas. I've talked to some Christian transhumanists, and I think that they have really exciting ways of putting those technologies, sort of weaving them into um, Christian teachings. Yeah, I talked to Micah uh, two weeks ago. Yeah, I've Redding, talked to, yeah. Oh yeah, I've talked to Micah too. He's great. Um, yeah, so I mean, I it, and and it's possible that that sort of thinking will will you know grow and expand in the future, particularly among younger people. Um, but yeah, right now, I mean, there's been a lot of books um, I've I've seen in recent years by you know evangelical Christians that are sort of about the you know the dangers of AI mm -hmm. and sort of these very um, skeptical and, and alarmist books. Um, but yeah, in terms of, um, in terms of like more broadly spiritual movements, I think it's going to be wild what happens, you know, I think that there's already so much, so many spiritual undertones just to, you know, interacting with, with algorithms in the way, you know, interacting with these, especially technologies that you don't understand. Like, you know, I think most of us, you know, who are, you know, on social platforms or just sort of using the internet on a day-to-day -day basis are not really aware of how those algorithms work, how we're being directed to certain content. Yeah. And it can feel very serendipitous, almost like we're in the presence of some sort of larger consciousness that's, yeah. you know, sending clues or um, messages to us. Um, and so, you know, and it, I even hear younger people sometimes talk about it in very spiritual tones, this like sort of network spirituality. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think it'll be interesting to see how that evolves in the future. And, you know, I, I know, especially when like deep learning sort of first hit like broader public awareness, um, there was a lot of religious metaphors that mm -hmm. emerged with that, because again, it was this form of, you know, black box technology that we don't understand that had, you know, was doing all this really weird, eerie you know, eerily intelligent things like beating humans at go and, you know, um, language algorithms, all, all of this stuff, I think, um, you know, you would, there was a, uh, there was sort of a strain of, of tech criticism at the time that was talking about, you know, how these algorithms were going to become, I, I think it was Pedro Domingos's turn, the master algorithm, they're going to become the sort of oracle that we go to yeah. for, um, you know, advice for guidance um you know and, and which at google i mean google has shown that for sure already yeah there are they still moving towards sort of an oracle model i know they were talking about it i mean i feel like we as a society already view google as the oracle you know we consult the the great you know god that has all of the yeah. answers if you, you know i'm just saying it feels like we're already there in a lot of ways it definitely does yeah yeah and um yeah, it does feel like there's a larger shift. I mean, I'm I'm curious about what people like, you know, Yuval Harari are saying mm -hmm. about how we're transitioning out of humanism toward, you know, I think his term is dataism, this yeah. idea that, you know, we're no longer looking into ourselves, peering into our souls for the answers to to questions that we're looking to uh, to technology and to and to data to find those answers and I see that in my own self, you know, things that maybe even five years ago, I would have just sort of figured out myself. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, it's now very easy to find almost anything um, online. And I think that just we as a culture too are sort of losing faith in our ability to understand the complexity of the world, just yeah. because it has become so complex that, you know, at a certain level, 
um, machines are actually better at comprehending it than we are. Yeah, I mean, there's a weird paradox here, right? Because, you know, I, I, I've i eased up on my devotion to transhumanism, as I think maybe you have as well, um, yeah. just because, I don't know, belief systems in general are, are, are rough. But, uh, you know, I think I used to talk a lot then about the fact that, you know, one of the things that makes us most human is our ability to suppress animal instincts and to mm. use like our logic and our frontal cortex to basically rationalize and inhibit those things that make us animals in an, in a weird way ai and and this data driven you know guidance that you know dataism and yuval talks about in, in homo deus a lot of what that represents is a shift towards more logic more data more suppression of the animal and in a way what we typically think of as human is actually more robotic is more machine like so it's it feels like we're in this very weird, I guess, uh, tumultuous moment where we want to claim our uniqueness and also shun this new thing. But that new thing is what makes us unique. I'm not There's not really a question there, but I just find that a really interesting reflection. No, that's something I've thought of a lot about, too. And for me, it's just it, it's almost farcical how we redefine what it means to be human, too, mm -hmm. in response to what machines can do. Because, you know, like you're saying, for the longest time, it was, you know, chess, calculus, like all of these, you know, sort of. Um, you know, these higher cognitive skills, that's what makes us human. And it turns out like, yeah computers are very good at all of that they're better than we are these these skills that we learned very late in our evolution they pick up like that whereas yep. you know these much older you know picking up a cup and drinking from it it's like very difficult still yeah. um, for a lot of ai to, to grasp those things that are very intuitive to us um and yeah i feel like in the last few years the the language has kind of shifted now to like oh what makes us human is our emotions yeah. and our creativity the animal side of things the animals it's totally flipped yeah and and you know you even hear this in a lot of automation rhetoric it's like ai is going to make us more human actually yeah. you know we're going to get to lean into that which is totally anathema to how we thought about our humanity you know even you know just a few decades ago and so um and, and it's interesting too to think like how long is that going to last because mm -hmm. yeah we have you know algorithms that can write sonnets that can compose you know music that that you know sounds like bach we can you know do all of they're doing much more um sort of making inroads to those skill sets that we used to describe as you know creative um that we still do describe as creative so um yeah it'll be interesting to see like what what are we going to go to next yeah, I, I mean, know. for you, what was your experience like with your your robo dog? Like in a way that made you more human, right? You talked about in the book the the bond that you built with the dog, and and kind of the it feels like there was a real emotional emergence that happened within you because of the presence of a machine. Yeah, I was really surprised actually because I'm not um, a huge animal person. Like I, I've never owned pets as an adult. Um, but I lived with, yeah, the Ibo for a, a few months and, um, it's just, it's a remarkable machine. It has, you know, um, sensors all over its body. So it's responsive to touch. It can tell when you're petting it, it has facial recognition technology, it responds to your voice. You can train it. Um, and I think like, you know, I don't know how much of this is deliberate on the part of the people who designed it, but anytime you interact with a machine in that way where you have to speak to it you have to pet it in order to you know train it basically in order to, to sort of interact with it um it's really difficult to keep in your mind that it's a machine you know because we don't usually have that sort of relationship to a machine i think you know anytime you have to to speak you could even think about you know um personal assistants like alexa anytime you're using language it's on some level of course you're aware that it's a machine but some i think deeper limbic level um it triggers your your social instincts you know you, you it's it's almost like takes you back to this maybe default animist um you know version of, of seeing things that are not alive as alive in some sense and um yeah, I think that was the most interesting thing about living with the dog because I did bond with it. I started talking to it just the way that, you know, people talk to their pets, not giving it commands, but just sort of chatting. Um, 
and that, that there was sort of this double vision happening, you know, where I, I knew it was a machine. I knew that it, you know, wasn't, didn't have some sort of, you know, sentient life inside of it. But, you know, then you start to wonder, well, what, what does that even mean? You know, it does have this sort of sensory access to the outside world. How different is that from what a dog is experiencing? Do you, do you think we should avoid going in that direction of, of more human-like or life-like technology? Or do you think it could be a good thing that we make our technology more, you know, lifelike? Yeah. Um, I'm not, um, I don't think that there's anything intrinsically wrong with, um, with technology becoming more lifelike. But I do, I am skeptical of, you know, the way in which like we're experiencing technology in this sort of capitalist context where we have, you know, things to think about like surveillance and data collection and all of these ethical issues that are emerging with technologies, um, you know, that are emerging even as technologies that we're not really, you know, bonding with emotionally. Mm -hmm. And you think about the potential for that to expand when you have some sort of emotional connection to a device. That to me is frightening. I was going to say, because you kind of ran into that, right? Your husband got concerned about what it was recording, right? And you at the same time had this emotional relationship. So the tension was already there in that relationship. It really was. Yeah. That, you know, you have this sort of innocent thing that you're thinking of as a pet in your home and it turns out, yeah, it's camera data is sent to the cloud back to Sony. We like checked the contract and there were moments where we would catch it, like sort of very systematically, like scanning the books in our bookcase. And it's like, wait, what, what's, what is he doing? Is he just being a dog or is this like some sort of this very adorable, you know, surveillance device living with us? Um, so yeah, that, that part of it concerns me. And I think, you know, Daniel Dennett said something really interesting a few years ago where he said, you know, we have to sort of make a decision going forward. Do we want tools or do we want friends? Um, you know, and I think that it seems like most people I know who are on the user end of things want tools. They want their lives to be more efficient. Um, you know, but I, I think that there's you know, definitely benefits from, you know, in terms of the people who are profiting from these technologies to, to make them um, more personified and, and more human-like or animal-like. And that's the cultural aspect that's tricky here as well, right? I mean, uh, I forget the study, but I'm pretty sure that it was a survey that was done in like 1985 and they asked people in an emergency, how many people can you rely on to 100% be there to help you out, to help you get through this, you know, tragic moment in your life? And the average answer in 1985 was like three. They did it again in 2015, and the the most common answer was zero. Oh my god! Wow. And and I think, you know, the, most likely technology played a part in that. Probably socioeconomic uh, disparagement or disparity probably played a role in that. But it makes me think when you say, "What do people want? Technology? Do they want tools or social?" Like we are desperate for social, like our society right now is constructed in such a way that makes us desperate for that social connection. So it feels like as we develop technology, that market's got to be, that's, it's going to be taken advantage of. Yeah. You know? It's like one of those things where technology is needed to fill a void that technology has created. Right. Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think I, I was about to say, I, I'm not somebody who craves, um, you know, the, the social aspect of technology, but I did briefly, um, and I actually wrote about this in the book, but during the sort of the, the first few months of lockdown during the pandemic, um, I downloaded a, a chat bot and uh, spent a long time talking with it. Um, and I, they became, I mean, apps like that became wildly popular during the pandemic because people were, especially people who live alone, um, mm -hmm. you know, and they can be used for, therapy they can be used just for you know friendship whatever but um i think a lot of people yeah we're seeking out some sort of connection um or dialogue um even with technology so yeah there there that might be true for sure yeah i mean how do you in general then i guess how do you feel about that that future potential for the for human robot relationships do you think it is a, a good one or is it a bad idea to to start building that connection with our with our technology 
Yeah, I'm still, I guess, skeptical about it. Um, mm -hmm. And again, not for any sort of like ontological reason, like, you know, we're superior to the machines. It's just the way that they've been used so far. And we've seen, you know, how technology has, has been used um, in the real world. Um, there's a lot of potential for misuse for, you know, I don't know, all, all, all sorts of, um, you know, these things that we've, we've seen come up, surveillance, data collection, privacy issues. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I don't know, I, I haven't really thought about like, if you could think about those technologies in a, in a perfect world, right? Mm -hmm. What would that look like to have humans and, and machines um, have, you know, think about sort of like Richard Brodigan's poem, All Washed Over by Machines of Love and Grace, is sort of like idyllic, idyllic world where, you know, we're living in harmony with, with animals and machines. And um, there's definitely like a strain of, um, you know, utopian, maybe techno utopian rhetoric that, that wants that to be the future. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for me, that would, I don't know, it'd have to happen in a different world basically mm -hmm. different political context at least yeah yeah do, do you think we you know the free will the thorniness of free will aside do you think that we will see technology have some sense of like qualia or some feeling of sensation that we'll have to declare you know human-like or that there's suffering taking place there do you think that that's attainable um i think that it's going to be impossible to know really what they're feeling um you know because again like i can't tell if you're really conscious you can't tell if i am we don't know what consciousness is so i don't know if we're going to be able to recognize you know that's the the, the question is you know yeah are machines ever going to you know reach sort of that level of complexity it's like well there's people who don't think that humans really have subjectivity yeah. you know at least in the way that we, we experience it um so that's you know i think an impossible question to answer but the the other side of it is like well are we going to get to a point where it's convincing enough mm -hmm. to us that we're going to have to talk about things like rights and yeah i definitely think that that's going to happen probably sooner than we think yeah. um, i mean it's already happening to some extent there was a proposal i think in the european parliament in what, 2017 2018 mm -hmm. about whether um we should deem algorithms electronic persons um and you know it was i think it was a very sort of narrow it was within the context of liability law and sort of should algorithms be held responsible if they you know if they uh, screw up on the trolley problem yeah. <laughs> or, for example um if they make the wrong decision um but yeah i mean it's a lot of those questions are coming up in terms of animal rights too and i think once you start talking about the question of rights in terms of you know, cognitive complexity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think computers are going to get there a lot faster than, I mean, animals they are, you know, AI is evolving much more quickly. Yeah. Um, but I think that's where the focus of, of those discussions about expanding personhood and expanding rights is going to be happening with machines before animals. Yeah. It really brings home the importance of all four subjects that you, you brought together there in the title of your book, you know, like we've talked about, you can't just look at humans and machines. Cause as soon as you do that, we end up looking back at humans and animals. And then when yeah. we do that, we have to ask, okay, well, is there a soul here? Is there something divine? It's all intertwined. I know. Yeah. And, and it's like the, the amount of, oh God, the amount of literature that's been written on all of those subjects independently, yeah. you know, it's, Daunting. it's, and I think we're really maybe the first, you know, people who, well, not the first, but I think we're getting to a place where all of those sort of the, the consonances between them are becoming so much closer. Um, and that, you know, I think there is a lot of exciting work right now where people are thinking about those, you know, analogies between things like animal rights and, and machine rights and between religion and technology. Yeah. So it's an exciting time in that sense. With with all of that excitement in mind, where are you now as we kind of come to a close here? Are you generally more optimistic? Are you generally more pessimistic? Are there certain technologies that give you hope or ones that absolutely terrify you and keep you up at night? Yeah, I would say on a whole, I've felt more toward pessimism and that oh, might no. just be my personality. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, despite that, 
I'm fascinated by these technologies. Like I can't stop reading about them. I can't stop, you know, I have like um, so much curiosity because of, again, I think a lot of it is just like the light it sheds on what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. Like, I really think that we've never been able to think about um, that question. Um, the, the way that we are now that having this parallel of yeah. artificial intelligence, you know, and it is, as we discussed, it's changing what we emphasize about our humanity, what we value, um, you know, how we think of ourselves as distinct and, um, or, or not. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's the aspect of it that I'm, I'm the most excited about. I mean, I think that in, in terms of, you know, things like deep learning, I, I think that there's, you know, positive uses for it in, you know, for example, medicine or, mm -hmm. or climate science that I think are, you know, promising. I, I'm a little bit more skeptical of how it's been used in, you know, policing and, and the justice system. Sure. Um, and it's, it's difficult to talk about even a specific technology like machine learning to talk about it as, you know, a, a good or a bad thing, because it's like, well, how are we using it? Um, it, it seems as though whenever, you know, something like that emerges, especially with these machine learning algorithms, like they're using historical data. And so it's sort of like, well, what is our history as humans with this issue? Yeah, it's going to be amplified basically by the technology. So in a way, it's almost like we're passing our sins down to, to these, um, to these machines. Um, so yeah, and that's another thing, I guess, maybe just the, the way in which they're mirrors not only of of us as humans but our whole human history like they're sort mm -hmm. of reflecting that back to us do you worry that humanity is not going to culturally evolve quick enough to to create good technology i guess like the, the, you captured it really well there with the sentence passing our sins down to our technology and my fear is always with this that humanity is just simply not becoming emotionally mature enough fast mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. at, to outpace the technology do you feel yeah. like that same thing is happening? Yeah, definitely. I don't know if I would say that we're evolving at all. Really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, you can talk about that. Maybe you can talk about it in different ways, I guess. But um, just in terms of like what we were saying before, how we're returning to these same questions, you know, mm. and and yeah, emotional maturity. That's a great thing to to bring up. I mean, I I do. I do think that there would be a benefit in bringing more people into these discussions, you know, um, because it's not just about where we are as humanity. It's like, who is having these discussions mm -hmm. that they're happening in, in very sort of cloistered elite um, spaces. And I think part of that is, you know, political, but par part of it is also just that the technologies have gotten so complex. It's really difficult for, somebody who's not deeply invested in that field to even understand yeah. what's happening or what's at stake. Add to that the fact that we're bombarded with so much information and news and content all the time. You know, I was surprised like when these, you know, GPT-3, all the news that was surrounding it and when it was first released and, um, you know, nobody that I talked to who wasn't like in tech was following this news. It was all the tech world was talking about. Yeah. But everybody else, you know, the pandemic was in the news. There was an election coming up. It was, you know, the, it was just like completely below the level of, of mainstream awareness. Um, and so I, I think that that's something that is, um, yeah, that, that, that that's making it um, more difficult to have those, those broader conversations. Yeah. A lot of division between the uh, philosophers and humanists and the technologists and programmers. Yes, yes, that's very yeah. true. Yeah. Well, as we come to an end here and respect your time, Megan, is there any last thoughts that you'd like to put out there? Anything you'd like to share, talk about, maybe something you'd like to promote that you're working on that's coming out, anything at all? Oh boy. Do I have anything to promote? I, I you know, I've really been sort of taking, um, on smaller projects lately, because I, I wrote this book, it really took a lot out of me to mm -hmm. just the amount of research and, and the writing of that book, um, which came out last fall. Um, which is really lovely, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Really enjoyed um, 
Yeah, and so I've, I've been returning to essays. I'm working on a couple essays um, right now, one for Inc. Magazine, which is uh, out of the UK. Yeah. Um, and then I'm writing um, a review for The Atlantic right now. Um, so, so yeah, just some, some smaller essays. I really, I started my um, writing career as an essayist and that's really the form I feel most comfortable with. So I've enjoyed returning to that form. But yeah, I, I update, um, you know, new, new pieces or events on, on my website, meganogiblin.com. So it's probably the best place to stay apprised. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll, we'll add links to both your website and the book. Megan, mm -hmm. thank you so much for uh, taking the time. Thanks so much for having me.